Hey, Tyson here from Refuge Church in Lenore City, Tennessee. Thank you for listening to our message today. Refuge Church is a family of faith sent to proclaim hope in Jesus Christ through relationships. For more resources and information about Refuge, please visit us on the web at refugeph.com. All right, y'all can be seated. We're going to be in John chapter 11 today. Uh, be pretty close to finishing up John chapter 11. Uh, we're about halfway through the Gospel of John. We've been going, we started that in 2023. So we've been here a while and we're just halfway through. So we've got a ways to go. Uh, but it's been good. The purpose, of this, uh, the purpose of this series is that John tells us that he wrote this letter so that we may have life in his name. And kind of the premise that we use is, is that Jesus doesn't just save us for heaven. But he wants to change our life now. Not that we just get eternal life, but that he, we get life now. There's something that happens inside of us when we become a Christian that changes our life now. And we're sort of focusing on that part of this idea of life. <clears throat> John chapter 20, 30 through 31, I just mentioned that. It says, Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples that are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah and the Son of God and that by believing you may have life in his name. We're going to talk about what it means to have life. John chapter 10 verse 10 it says a thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. But I have come that you may have life uh, and have it in abundance. Um, It's not that he just wants us to have life, but he wants us to have life in abundance. He wants it to change. He wants it to be good. He wants it to be in this relationship with him. John chapter 6, verse 35, he says, I am the bread of life. Jesus told him, no one who comes to me will ever be hungry. No one who believes in me will ever be thirsty again. When you think about the gospel of John, what the writer John is doing is he's putting these arrows out there (coughs) continuously that point us to what it means to have life. Today is a really big arrow. Like sometimes you drive down the road and you're driving down the interstate and you may miss a sign. This is a big sign that, that, that John has put out for us to understand what it means to have life and have life in his name. And if we're not careful, we'll miss it. And, and this is what I think about. <coughs> I was mowing the yard yesterday and I couldn't help but think about how modern day Christianity, I think, has it backwards. Because we think that if we try our best to be obedient, it will get us closer to God. And that's not what God intends. The intention is that we get closer to God, and then that will change how we behave. We'll begin to follow Him. When we begin to look at these these arrows that John is putting down, there's, there's going to be a climax in the Gospel of John that sort of reveals kind of the whole thing. And by the way, it has to do with a vine. That's going to be kind of where we're headed if you want to kind of cheat and look ahead. But, but the idea here <coughs> is that, that he's laying out these arrows for us and that we can have life in his name and that it's going to change us, right? But, but we want to just try harder and try harder. That's why when we think about this idea of having life and have it abundantly, we don't really feel that way. Like, like many, many people who are Christians today don't feel like that they're experiencing this life that he's talking about, it, much less life in abundance, Now, does that mean this idea of life abundance, does that mean we'll have everything that we ever need? No. Jesus says, I'm the bread of life. That's kind of like our, he didn't say I'm the Ferrari of life or the, you know, the beach house of life. He said, I'm the bread of life. It's the things that we essentially need. And the idea there when he said that is this idea of contentment. And part of the reason that we don't experience life in his name is because we're trying to find contentment and satisfaction in all the wrong places. And that's why we're not experiencing it. So today, we're going to flip the script and try to get back to what I think Jesus and John really means when he says we can have life in his name. <coughs> this, this passage is going to point us in the right direction. So in the Gospel of John, there's seven I am statements that Jesus makes. When he says, I am, and then he he follows it with this statement, it points us back to Exodus chapter 3 when uh, God was calling Moses to go pull his people out of Egypt. And and Moses said, well, what if they ask me what your name is? And God said, you tell them the I am sent you. That was how God manifested his name. He's the I am. 
So when Jesus makes these I am statements, he's not just saying something about I am this. He's saying, first of all, I am God. He's claiming to be God. That's why they want to pick up rocks and throw them at him, because he's making that claim. So these are very important statements. And in John chapter 11 is the fifth I am statement. But they build. I want you to see the first one is I am the bread of life. That's that idea of contentment and satisfaction. And we find our we find life by feeding on him is kind of the, the idea there. Uh, the second one is I am the light of the world. That in this darkened world, Jesus is the light. Now I don't know if you paid attention to the opening ceremonies of the Olympics, but it was pretty dark. Evil, I would say. And and in this darkened, even world, Jesus is the light. He's the one that brings good. Light is good. Evil (laughs) is darkness, right? And then he says, I am the door or the gate to the sheep. So this idea of how we get this life, he's saying, you enter into this life through him. He is the way in. There's no other way except through him. Then he says, I am the good shepherd. I'm not just a decent shepherd, I'm not a pretty good shepherd. I'm the good shepherd. How good is he as a shepherd? He lays down his life for his sheep. He calls his sheep by name. And we talk about this idea of life is that he supplies. He is the good. He, Jesus is the way in. He is the shepherd. The shepherd protects. He provides. He comforts. He leads. That's the idea. You see these arrows. They're all pointing us to what it means to have life. And then you get to the one today in John chapter 11. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. He is the source from, from death to life. That without God, we are spiritually dead. We're separated from him. And he's going to give us life. So all these are directional signs. <clears throat> and when we get to John chapter 11, I'm going to go backwards here and go back to John chapter 1. Because I think it's important for us to see context But all these things point us to that. So let's go back to John chapter 1. Because really in the first 15 or 16 verses in John chapter 1, he lays out the rest of the book. He lays out this letter and this path for us. So we can always go back. Look at John chapter 1 verse 12. He says, But to all who did receive him, he gave them the right to be children of God, to those who believe in his name, who were born not of natural descent, nor of the will of the flesh, or of the will of man, but of God. Now here's a secret. He says you have the right to become children of God by receiving and believing in his name, faith. That's what that is. And we get to be children of God. Here's the secret. From the very beginning of the Gospel of John, he's giving us this idea of this secret. You remember I told you about how the culmination is kind of like in John where it talks about the vine. It's about relationship. A child is in a relationship, personal relationship, part of the family, right? So that's important. And, and we do that by believing and receiving, <coughs> uh, receiving and believing in his name. He, so much so is that important is that John spent almost all of John chapter 3 talking about the concept of being born again with a guy named Nicodemus. It starts with God doing something inside of us. That when we put our faith in him, he puts his Holy Spirit inside of us. And it begins to change us. We begin to be born again. We begin to be made new. That's where this life comes from. Is what God is doing inside of us through his spirit. And it is very relational. It is about this fellowship we have with him. Now let's back up a little bit more in John chapter 1. Verse 6. It says, There was a man sent from God whose name was John. It's John the Baptist, not the writer of the Gospel of John. And it says, he came as a witness to testify about the light so that all might believe through him. Now that statement there is interesting because this whole thing that we're seeing in the Gospel of John and these people beginning to be healed and these people who begin to follow uh, Jesus and you you get into Acts and you, you see the church just explode. You know where it all started? It started with the testimony of John the Baptist. He baptized Jesus, and he saw the Holy Spirit descend on him. This was was the reason that he was baptizing. He knew that his ministry would reveal the Savior. So he was being obedient. And there Jesus is, and he baptizes him, and the Holy Spirit descends on him, and God says, this is my son, in whom I'm well pleased. And there it is. 
And then these very first disciples who begin to follow Jesus, who later become apostles, they didn't see any miracles from Jesus. They didn't hear any sermons from Jesus. They believed in the testimony of John the Baptist. That's where it started. So it's about this idea of faith comes from hearing the words of Jesus and the words about Jesus. John the Baptist told his disciples when he saw Jesus, he says, He's the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He told them the gospel. And, and see, what we see is, and for the rest of the gospel of John, and they're gonna lay, there's a pattern here, and I'm going to lay it out for you today, is that it's about believing the words of Jesus and about Jesus and being obedient and following him. It's about the testimony. Now, he did the signs to prove that he was who he was, but it's really about following who he says he is, Right? So it's about this idea of a testimony. Now let's fast forward to John chapter 5 before we get to John chapter 11. Got to lay a lot of groundwork here, (laughs) okay? John chapter 5, Jesus is going to tell us what's going to happen in John chapter 11, which points us to what's going to happen later for us, the resurrection. Look at what he says in John chapter 5 verse 24. He says, truly I tell you, Anyone who hears my word and believes on him who sent me has eternal life and will not come under judgment, but has passed from death to life. Verse 25, truly I tell you, an hour is coming and is now here that when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. Remember that statement when we get to John chapter 11. It says, for just as the Father has life in himself... Where do we find life? In God, right? It's in Him. So also has He granted to the Son to have life in Himself. It's found in Jesus also. Verse 27. And He has granted Him the right to pass judgment because He is the Son of Man. Do not be amazed at this because the time is coming when all who are in the graves will hear His voice and come out. Those who have done good things to the resurrection of life, but those who have done wicked things to the resurrection of life. Of condemnation. And I don't know if you know this or not, but everybody will live eternally. It's just a matter of where. And that's what this passage is sort of talking about, right? Is that we will all live in eternity somewhere. And 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 he says, listen, it it comes down to whether we've put our faith in him. Those who have, what does it say? It says, those who have done good things, those who have put their faith in Jesus, those who have received and believed in his name, who become children of God, who've been born again, who God begins to transform. Or there's those who have rejected Jesus, who will spend eternity exactly where you wanted to spend it, which is apart from Jesus, which is a place called hell. And see, this is the idea, and this is what he's telling us about. But he's also pointing us to what's going to happen in John chapter 11. Okay, so now let's get to John chapter 11, finally. All right, John chapter 11, verse 7. A little context. Um, They're wanting to kill Jesus. Like they've already threatened to kill him multiple times. He knows that his life is about to end. That's the reason he came here anyway, so he's... He understands that. But he knows that if he goes back to Jerusalem or towards near Jerusalem, he could be killed. Look at John chapter 11 verse 7. It says, then after that, he said to his disciples, let's go to Judea again. He, he hears about his friend Lazarus who is sick. And Mary and Martha, they're, they're, they're his friends too. And they're, they're trying to get Jesus to come and heal Lazarus. <coughs> and he says, then after that, he said to his disciples, let's go to Judea again. Rabbi, the disciples told him, just now the Jews tried to stone you, and you're going there again? What's about to take place in John chapter 11 in Bethany, just outside of Jerusalem, is so important that he's willing to risk his life. Matter of fact, this is the pivotal miracle or sign that will ultimately cost Jesus his life. Because this is one of those ones that they couldn't argue. A man came back from the dead to life. And there he is, so much so that they wanted to kill Lazarus too. Because it proved that Jesus is who he says he is. Look at uh, John chapter 11 verse 14. So uh, Jesus is talking to his disciples. They hear that Lazarus is 
had been sick. And here's the thing. I don't know if you know this. If you've not been here the last couple of weeks, you may not know this. But Jesus got word that Lazarus was sick. And you would think that he would just take off in a real hurry to get <laughs> and, and go and heal Lazarus. But he didn't. He stayed where he was at long enough that Lazarus died. And, and when, he, when he finally gets there, Mary and Martha both ask him, Jesus, if only you had been here, Lazarus wouldn't have died. Because they know that Jesus had the power to heal. They had faith enough to believe that he could heal. Jesus, if you had only been here. He's having this conversation with his disciples. Look at verse 14. He says, uh, so Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus has died. And he says, I'm glad that I wasn't there so that you may believe. But let's go to him. And then Thomas called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, let's go too so that we may die with him. Man, there's a lot in that little passage right there. He says, I'm glad that I wasn't there. I'm glad that I didn't heal Lazarus so that you may believe. This is a sign that he's going to do that is about faith. He wants his disciples to have faith that he can do what he says he can do. That he's the savior of the world. That he can resurrect us to eternal life. He wants them to believe because faith is important. It's the most important thing for us. Look at verse 25. <clears throat> he gets there. Mary and Martha are both like, if only you'd been here. And he has this conversation with Martha in verse 25. Jesus said to her, Martha, or Jesus said to her, that is Martha. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. Now there's his fifth I am statement. And I'm going to look at something in there that's going to be pretty special here in just a minute. I'm not going to point it out just now. I've got, to, I've got to leave you the cliffhanger to come back, right? It says, the one who believes in me, even if he dies, will live. Everyone, in who, everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Again, it's about faith. Do you believe this? Do you believe what I just told you? I haven't done anything yet. I haven't performed any miracles. But do you believe it? Yes, Lord, she told him. I believe that you're the Messiah, the Son of God, who comes into the world. You know what that is? It's faith. He's saying, you know, I, I don't understand why you didn't come earlier. I don't understand why Lazarus died. I don't understand why we're even standing here. But I believe in who you are. And I believe in your goodness. And I believe that you're going to do what you say you're going to do. And I'm going to put my trust in that. And I'm going to leave it at that. And, and listen, I don't know where you are in life. And there are people in here who have been through things in life where we question God. We've probably all been there. And, and, and here's what I want us to do. We, we shouldn't question God. We may question his tactic. Why did it happen this way? But we should not question his character and who he is and how much he loves us. He's proven it. That while we were still sinners at the right time, Christ died for us. That's how he proved it. We may question the how, but we should never question the who. Then we get to down to verse 39. So Jesus is going to do something about it. He says, remove the stone, Jesus said. Martha, the dead man's sister, told him, Lord, there's already a stench because he's been dead for four days. Jesus said to her, didn't I tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they removed the stone. Now I have a question. <clears throat> if you're in this position, are you going to move the stone? That took a step of faith, did it not? It took a big step of faith. So, <clears throat> so they removed the stone. Then Jesus raised his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you heard me, and I know that you always hear me. But because of the crowd standing here, I said this, so that they may believe that you sent me. Again, Jesus prays this prayer out loud to his Father. Why? So that they will believe. It's about faith. It's about him being who he says he is. Verse 43. After he said this, he shouted with a loud voice. That's important. Why? Go back to John chapter 5. The dead will hear his voice and live. He told us. 
He shouted with a loud voice. Now, could he have just raised Lazarus from the dead? Sure. Did he have to say a word? No. But there's a pattern going on here that he's trying to show us. That it's in response to his word that we get life. I'll show you that in just a second. Let me finish the passage. He shouted with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. And the dead man came out, bound hand and foot with linen strips uh, and with his face wrapped and in cloth. And Jesus said to him, unwrap him and let him go. (coughs) Those who will hear his voice will live. Now I want to go back and I want to lay out the pattern for you. All these little arrows that John's been dropping for us along the way in the Gospel of John. And we're halfway through. The first miracle he performed was in John chapter 2. He turned the water into wine. He said, fill the water jars. You know what they did? They filled the water jars. They responded in faith. John chapter 4, he has an encounter with the woman at the well. Lady with a bad reputation. And he begins to tell her about living water. And she said, you know, there's going to come a Messiah one day and he's going to tell us all things. And Jesus said, I'm he. And you know what she did? She responded in faith and believed. She went and told her neighbors. And they came back and believed. Later in John chapter 4, a royal official came to him. And his his child was about to die. And he says, Jesus, I need you to come back and heal my child. And Jesus said, go, your child will live. And you know what he did? He didn't wait till he got word back from his house that his child left. You know what he did? He left. Because he believed. He took Jesus at his word and he responded in faith and he went. Next, Jesus had an encounter with the man at the pool of Bethesda who was crippled. And Jesus said, pick up your mat and walk. How long had it been since this guy had ever walked? We had a work day here at church yesterday. It was about four hours. I couldn't hardly walk when I got home. This guy hasn't walked. And and he said, pick up your mat and walk. And you know what the guy did? He picked up his mat and he walked. He responded in faith. Then we saw there was a blind man that Jesus encountered. And he put mud on his eyes and he said, go wash in the pool of Siloam. You know what he did? He went and he washed in the pool of Siloam. Now, could have Jesus done all these things without saying a word? He certainly could have, but he didn't. Because this is the pattern. It's it's our response to what he says in his words. It's how we get life. It's how we get life in his name. It goes back to the very beginning in John chapter 1. That by believing in his name. The gospel, Romans chapter 1, verse 16 says, For the gospel is the power of God to salvation to all who believe. You you realize that we as Christians, we can tell people the gospel and they can respond in the same way. Just as they did to Jesus. They can take it at his word and respond in faith. You see the pattern? Now, here's the good thing about all this. Like if, if, if you're just reading John chapter 11 and you stop there, you miss a very important piece. You know, the, the chapters were put in later. Like John wasn't writing 11 verse 1. He didn't do that. Like we added that later so that we could find stuff. <clears throat> so we need to keep reading. I'm going to skip over some verses and we're going to go to John chapter 12. And this is the secret. This is the big arrow. John chapter 12 verse 1. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, right next to Jerusalem. He came back, right, where Lazarus was, the one Jesus had raised from the dead. So they gave a dinner for him there. Martha was serving them, and Lazarus was one of them reclining at the table with him. Now, if you're not careful, you'll miss it. Lazarus was raised to life... To sit at the table with Jesus. And see, this is the secret. It's not about our obedience. It's about sitting at the table with the Savior. 
This whole thing about life, how we have life in his name. We don't get life by being obedient. We get life by sitting at the table with the Savior. Now, I'm going to just, we're going to be a little late today, so just hang on. It's been two weeks. I've had a couple weeks off. i got a lot to say. We have a refuge family meal today. And if you're new to us, this is a big deal to us. We do six of these a year, odd months, at the last Sunday of the month. And the reason this is a big deal to us is because the table is a big deal to us. It was a big deal to Jesus. He sat with Lazarus at the table. Uh, <coughs> he, he had meals with sinners. This is a big deal. One day we're going to feast with him uh, at the table, right? That's kind of the point. But the table is important to us because we want to be a church family. That's the reason we shake hands. If you're a visitor here, you're like, they still shake hands? That's old school. You're right, it is. And church growth people will tell you not to do it because it makes people feel uncomfortable. But it's who we are. And it's who we're going to be. And that's the reason we eat together. And we're going to, when this is over, we're going to spread these chairs out and we're going to line up tables. And you know what? We don't use round tables. We put tables in a line. And we eat together with people we may not even know because we are a church family and because that's important to us. Now, you don't have to stay. I'm not putting pressure on If you do feel uncomfortable, hey, no problem. You're more than welcome to come here. We want you to be here. But that's why we do what we do because the table is important because we want to use the table as an evangelism tool. We want to teach people to go out and share their table with other people, invite people into their home, invite people to the restaurants and begin to share your life with them. And you'll be amazed at what God will do in other people's lives when you begin to do that. Just praying at your meal can make an impact with a lost person. It's important. But here's what we see. And if we're careful, we're going to miss it. But the whole point, I want you to think about this. We talk about this idea of it's not just about eternal life, it's about life now. Well, well, i got a question for you. What's eternal life about? Is it about streets of golds and mansions and all those things? Is that really what it's about? Because i got news for you. If you went to a place that was streets of gold and mansions and God wasn't there, you know what it would be? It would be hell. So what makes it heaven is the fact that God is there. So if that's what eternal life is about, what is life about now? It's about sitting at the table. With the Savior now. It's the most important thing. It's why we've got it backwards. I'm going to ask TC and Danielle to come up here. While they're coming up here, I want to finish with this. Go back to John chapter 11 verse 25. It says, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. I am the resurrection and the life. Who's the life? Jesus is the life. You want life? Go to Jesus. You want to have life abundantly? Go to Jesus. You want to, you want to live this life that, that uh, transforms us? It's not about obedience. It's about Jesus. It's about sitting at the table what it's about. It's about relationship. This is the big arrow that's pointing us. When when we, uh, here's a question I guess I have for you. When is the last time you blocked out the world for 30 minutes to an hour and just tried to spend time with the Savior? You want to know why we're not living life abundantly? You want to know why we're not, we don't feel like we're living that life? is because the enemy knows that all they got to do is distract us. And you know what? They can even distract us with good things. I can be as easily distracted by good things as you can. We like to read books about the Bible instead of reading the Bible. That's a distraction. I've done it. Did it while I was on vacation. The devil will easily distract us with good things to miss the greatest thing. I want you to block out 30 minutes to an hour a couple of times this week and just spend time with the Savior. It's going to be uncomfortable. If you don't like quiet, it's going to be the most uncomfortable thing you've done in a while. But it'll get easier. 
Spend time with the Father at the table. I I thought about this analogy uh, this morning. If you're a parent, would you rather have obedience or presence? Which would you rather have? A, A child that behaves perfectly that you never get to see Or a child that's not perfect, but you get to spend time with? I think I know your answer. So what does God want from us? Does he want our obedience? Or does he want our presence? He wants our presence. Thank you for listening to this message today brought to you by Refuge Church. Please visit our website for more resources as well as our YouTube channel. Just search for Refuge Church in Lenore City, Tennessee to find us. We hope that this message has helped you find hope in Jesus Christ.